instead of running around blaming me, you know, given the nature of all this new shit, this could be a, a, a lot more uh, complex. It might not be just such a simple, you know, I've got information, man. New shit has come to life. Hey, yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you have entered that phase known as detox, where we're deprogramming you 528 hertz at a time. That's a straight up violation of your heart chakra. 528 never hurts so good, am I right? But don't be shy, don't be shy. Cuddle right on up to it and let it vortex that frequency right on through that ear canal. And don't let it stop till it goes pop. Anyway, I am Ryan Peverly. Welcome, yes, welcome to the deprogram. In this episode, I am chatting with Heather Shepard, a certified holistic health coach, the host of the Primal Pioneer podcast, and a former Division I athlete who healed her own traumatic brain injury using a protocol she now calls the Sunlight RX. You know what I've noticed more and more in recent years is people looking for practical, easy-to-implement health advice. Some people want magic bullets. Some people don't mind putting the work in to heal themselves. And the thing is, what you'll hear in this chat actually checks both of those boxes. It's practical health advice, nothing fancy, very straightforward, and it's rooted in what I call common sense science. You don't need a media blitz or government or corporate-backed doctors on TV to convince you that sunlight is good for you. They will spend plenty of time trying to convince you that sunlight is bad for you. But the truth of it is, sunlight is one of nature's many multivitamins, and it's right outside your front door at no cost to you. No expensive supplements needed, no fancy equipment, no doctor, hell, no health coach needed. Just pop off your top and you're good to go. In fact, sit back, relax, and pop that top off right now while you're listening to the chat here. Maybe your bottoms too. Enjoy. Heather Shepard, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I'm looking forward to shining some light on the topics that we have on our list here today. Thanks, Ryan. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm glad you invited me on. I love what you're doing. The information you're getting out to people is is awesome, much needed. So very happy to be here. 100% could not co-sign on that statement more. I found you through your podcast, The Primal Pioneer. And I actually want to start there with that title because in your first episode, you talked about growing up primal. And I'm sure the audience could infer what that means. But for the sake of conversation, how would you characterize a primal life? What are the features of a primal pioneer? Oh, man, such a good question. So the primal pioneer really stemmed from basically both my upbringing and from the way that I'm trying to live my life today. But basically, the primal pioneer goes back to our roots and how we lived before all this modern crap got thrown into us with screens and Wi-Fi and cell phones and whatnot. But basically, the primal pioneer is all about living under the sun, living on the land, making our daily choices more so revolved around nature, growing food, raising animals. That's how I was raised. And I don't think my family actually had they would probably have chose maybe a more modern route, maybe if they had more finances available to them, but we were a very poor family growing up. And so, you know, we raised our own animals. None of my friends did this, right? They had a lot, they were more well off than we were. So we raised our own animals, had our own garden. My dad is an avid hunter. So he would go out and hunt wild game depending on the season. And this is how we lived. We lived connected to the land. We lived connected to the animals. My mom rendered her own lard and made homemade everything. And so I'm very fortunate for this upbringing. And I moved away from that as I got into my college years. I was like, oh, more modern living. You know, it just kind of was the lifestyle adopted. And then once I began to wake up to just how disconnected and unhealthy that is, I started to shift back to basically my primal roots. And that's really where the primal pioneer stems from, for sure. Yeah, it's definitely informed what you do now, you know, just for a living with your holistic health practice there. And to that point, you call yourself a quantum healer, or a quantum clinician, which is one of the coolest things I've ever heard anybody use to describe themselves, to be honest. And you say on your website that 
before you became that, you had to experience a few things in your life. You got a bachelor's in nutritional science, a master's in alternative medicine. Uh, you had a seven-year apprenticeship in frequency healing. And this is all the cool shit that you know, I think we should be learning nowadays. But you also said that you had to experience a TBI, a traumatic brain injury, which is an extremely difficult situation to overcome. But here you are, fresh and healthy as ever. You look good. And quite literally, you took your own medicine, or I guess what would become your own medicine to overcome that TBI. And I know it was a long path to get here. So please tell the audience about, you know, what happened and then your frustration with the standard Western approach to, to treating that. And then what ultimately convinced you to seek these alternative modalities? Yeah. So growing up, I was also a, an avid athlete and mostly played basketball, played a little softball, but mostly played basketball and went on to play division one basketball in college. And then after that, I went on to train professional athletes, NBA, MLB guys, one day I was on my way to work, driving, just me, myself, and I in the car, lost control of my car, split a telephone pole in two, smashed my head on the steering wheel. And so yeah, I thought it was going to be a minor injury because I went to the hospital. All scans were clear, CAT scan, MRI, everything clear. There was no red flags, no bleeding in the brain, et cetera. But I felt like shit. I was dizzy. I had migraine headaches. Uh, every time I would walk, I would feel this pressure shoot up into my head, into my brain and really was suffering. There was no way I could go out and train an athlete how to lift weights or like run a sprint or, you know, it is just, it wasn't even possible. I couldn't even walk myself without being in pain. So this ultimately led me to going to acupuncture school because literally that was the only thing that gave me minor relief. Some days would be a few hours, some days, a, a few days after a treatment that I would experience relief, but that was enough hope to keep me going like, oh, there's something here. There's likely something here that is going to help me make a full recovery. And it helped me in, for a while, but I, I soon learned that there was much more to healing my TBI than, than that, especially long-term. But that got my foot in the alternative medicine door because it was a world that I was, I dappled in before, you know, getting my undergrad in nutrition and getting into food and food science and whatnot. But I hadn't gone to this length and this extent as to after my TBI. So it really got my foot in the door to the alternative medicine world because conventional medicine had literally no good suggestions, no good treatments for a TBI. And they literally thought I was just making up my symptoms because on the outside, I looked like a normal person. But what was going on inside of me, like the dizziness, the migraines, the PTSD, it was like very real and very debilitating. So that's something that they just have no answers for um, and make people feel like a complete idiot if they, you know, just show up looking like a normal person with these symptoms. So it definitely got me started on, on the healing path and in the alternative medicine world for sure. Yeah. And we'll get into a little later exactly, you know, what you use for yourself because it's what you use with your clients now too. I just wanted to circle back to that word alternative. I hate calling these alternative modalities because it makes the allopathic way seem standard. You're right. And not standard. It's not medicine. It's not healing. It's, I'm not even sure what it is. It's, I think it's a death cult, <laughs> but I know really, no, that's a good way to say it. <laughs> Yeah. I think what we're going to be talking about here is just, it's better. It's more efficient. And I don't want to use the C word. I know it's a dangerous one, but we're going to be talking about ways to reverse chronic disease. Yeah. And that's exactly what you did. So I like people who, you know, not only have the academic background with this stuff, but they have the actual experiential background. And this is why I wanted to talk to you because you've done the work, you've done the work in the classroom, but you've also done it to yourself to overcome that TBI. Before we get too far away from the primal lifestyle, I just wanted to throw some stuff out here too about rewilding yourself, going back to that primal lifestyle. And I think it's important to comprehend that it's not just a shitty diet and a lack of movement that puts people in a state of dis-ease. To that point, you did these podcast episodes recently where you're talking about really the root cause of a lot of this dis-ease in the body is urbanization or these urban lifestyles. And it's kind of what you hinted at when you were talking about how you went to college. I'm assuming that you sank back into this urban lifestyle and you characterize what a primal lifestyle is. How would you characterize an urban lifestyle? You know, what is it that encompasses that? Because I don't think you actually need to live in a city to have this lifestyle either. No, you don't. You can literally do it anywhere. I mean, literally, you can live the urban lifestyle, whether you're living in a tribe in Africa or South America, or if you're somebody living in New York City. So 
what characterizes a, an urban lifestyle is uh, it's been this shift since the since the light bulb was introduced and electricity was brought into the home in the uh, late 1800s. We made this drastic shift from basing our lifestyle and our work choices, our food choices on outdoor living. These shifts in electricity coming into the home, the light bulb coming into the home drew us indoors. And so now we could spend more time inside. We could have light on 24 seven if we wanted to. We could do night shift work. That was the beginning. It, it has gone in a serious, you know, downward spiral since then with, you know, then we get into the fluorescent lights and the LED lights. And I'm sure we'll get into those a little bit more, but these things allow us to be inside more. And then this development of technology, computer, our screens, and now we have this stuff like available to us all the time on our iPhones and cell towers and whatnot. So basically an urban lifestyle is one that disconnects us from nature, draws us inside in front of a screen, in front of fake light, and completely disassociates us with the natural world and with sunlight. And, you know, most people don't even know, like when I tell them like, eat a seasonal diet, like it's really important to eat a seasonal diet. The most common question I get is, well, what's growing in my area in this season? And that right there just speaks volumes to how disconnected we've become from nature. And so this, this urbanized lifestyle is basically an indoor lifestyle in front of a screen. I mean, really simple terms. Yeah, it's pretty disheartening and pretty disenchanting, to be honest. And I wanted to touch on some of the other things that fuel these lives that are actually detrimental to our health. You know, like obviously you mentioned things like screen time, uh, blue light, Wi-Fi aren't good for us. But I think there are some other more seemingly innocuous things that we take for granted that actually contribute to poor health outcomes. And I'm thinking of things like central air and heating like our ancestors didn't have this stuff but we don't realize that like these amenities actually contribute to dis-ease in the body and poor health outcomes right yeah no that's a really good point because it's just like the light bulb as you're saying you can go on and flip on the ac it can be you know let's say you know like you you live in ohio you can get down into the zeros you can get in the 20 degrees but you know people go and they flip the heat switch on to 80 and so they make it summertime in their home. Now, not that you have to live in 30 degrees, you know, in your home, but doing this drastic difference in temperature change really has a detrimental effect on your circadian biology, on your health, on your mitochondrial health. And you're totally right that it, this is another form of urbanization. You don't think about these things. We don't think about the detriments of Wi-Fi or holding our cell phone in our hand or like looking at a screen. And we don't understand that the implications that turning on blasting AC or the heat in the winter summer has on, on our health. But these have become just kind of normal things. We've adopted this lifestyle and we don't think twice about them. But they really have some serious health implications for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just to that point on the, the heating in the air, I've, I've tried recently the past couple of years to not use that stuff as much. And, you know, it's weird because like it is beneficial on some level, but I think like, especially during the days here in Ohio in the spring, summer and fall, I try to keep the house open, doors open, windows open as much as I can, because I feel like that fresh air is cleansing because our indoor air quality is actually just as toxic, if not more so sometimes than the outdoor air. I think people forget that, you know, your indoor environment is actually, since you are sadly spending more time indoors, that this is toxic in here and getting that fresh air to sort of move through the house can cleanse some of those toxins out too. And that's why I think like turning off those systems, you know, uh, central air and heating sometimes, uh, even in the winter, I've lowered the temperatures that I'm comfortable at. Uh, and we can maybe talk more about that because I've been doing cold therapy for a while now. You just get used to it and you adapt to these colder temperatures and, and you don't really mind them as much. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I think that's awesome that you do that because if we look at, take somebody in your area in ancient times before they had, they had heat available to them, they would naturally be getting cold this time of year. And so after they reaped all the benefits of the fall harvest and, and all those foods that are available at that time, it's natural for people to put on some weight at that time because 
This is literally was a survival mechanism. So when they went into winter and these foods became more scarce and they got colder, this is the way that their body burned energy and pulled on their energy reserves and allowed them to stay warm during the winter months naturally because their mitochondria could generate heat because they allowed themselves to get cold. We don't allow ourselves to do that today. So I think what you're doing there with regard to keeping your your house cooler, especially during the winter, I mean, if people would just do that who live at the higher latitudes, man, they would they would benefit so much more, especially people who struggle with any kind of chronic disease, especially type two diabetes, obesity, even cancer, you know, these things, our indoor lifestyle really can make or break our outcomes with those those kind of diseases. So I think it's awesome that you're doing that. I think it's really important, especially for mitochondrial health, for sure. Yeah, and I do want to talk more about mitochondria and their function in the body. But I wanted to just stay on the topic for just a moment. You know, part of rewilding yourself is also busting out of the system. And I was glad to see that you did you did a <laughs> podcast episode about that recently. You said the government makes sure that we don't live very wild. That they create a mindset that we need them and can't survive without them. And you're speaking my language there because I don't believe any of that either. But I'm curious though, from your perspective, what steps have you taken, if any, to remove yourself from that system? Oh man, so many. And they've gradually happened over time. I think really after my TBI and I could no longer, I quite literally couldn't hold a job because I wouldn't feel well and I'd have to go home or I'd have to leave or I'd have to call in sick. And it's like, fuck, I can't even, I can't even show up to this job. I'm like, forget it. I'm just going to create my own business. And that was a huge start of my rewilding lifestyle because now I'm making my own money. I'm making my own income. I'm building my own business. I don't have a boss. I'm my own boss. Nobody's going to create my hours or tell me what to do or what I can't do. And, you know, part of the rewilding lifestyle, I feel like is we tend to, uh, and I think we're in the middle of this whole thing, just being totally blasted open with regard to our education and our, our working, you know, what's a regular job and whatnot and our retirement systems. Those things are just going to go to shit. I feel like over the next 20 years, it's not even going to be, uh, I don't even think it's going to be part of our mindset or lifestyle anymore to like go to college and then get a job in your field and, you know, do the nine to five thing. That shit's already starting to crumble. But those things keep us in the system too. They We have to abide by certain time frames and have certain educational backgrounds. And so when I had my TBI, it allowed me to work for myself. And then I also could learn whatever I wanted because nobody was telling me, hey, you have to study this or learn this or memorize this protocol in order to to work or hold a job. So it freed up how I worked, how the education that I was able to give myself. And that was huge. So today, I'll never work for anyone again. I don't have health care. I won't have health care. If they tax me for health care, like whatever, you know, I, I'm not I'm not going to sign up for that. And I'm not saying that other people don't have to do that. This is just how I choose not to. I'm not paying into that that system. And I make my food choices with local people as much as possible to support them and, and you know, distribute the money to uh, the local communities as, as much as I can. I mean, there's a lot that I do with regard to not not feeding into the system. So... Today, our education system and our workforce really keeps people stuck in shitty environments and they pay them crap most of the time. And so at least working out of that, I think, can be very empowering for for people. I don't know if that answered your question. I think it's a, it's a good one. It's a loaded one. There's so much to it. But it's definitely been a gradual process for me, for sure. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, you have to start somewhere. And it kind of is like, I think for a lot of people, it is looking at the simpler things to start with, right? It is looking at more local food sources. It is looking at different ways to generate income. And you've done that. I've done that. I'm, at least I'm still trying to do that. But I also think the last couple of years has, and this goes to your point about workforce and the education system, like this is an old system. It's so old. That is breaking down in real time right in front of our eyes. And it's scary, but it's also like liberating at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, there's opportunity there for the people who see it yeah. and for the people who have the motivation and the discipline and the work ethic to seize that opportunity and create something new for themselves. And you've done that. I'm trying to do that. I know there are people listening who 
have done it and are trying to do it as well. And it's just, you know, you're here and you're just, you're just one success story of hundreds and thousands of people who have done this and are doing this now. So I'd add one more thing to that because I don't want it to seem like, you know, you have to quit your nine to five, like immediately if you're someone out there looking to do that, because I basically did that because I had to, I literally couldn't go because I was healing my body and needed to do that. And I will tell you that in the beginning of starting my own business, I was living off of pennies and food stamps. So it wasn't like this grand old, like amazing thing to start with. It was a real struggle. And it took me about seven years in order to build my business to get to a point where it was in a much more successful place financially and being seen and whatnot. So if you're someone out there who's who's has this desire to be self-employed and work for yourself, give yourself the time to do it. Know that it can take time, but don't don't give up. Just keep after it because it will eventually pay off if you can keep stick with it. For sure. And I did want to correct you and I don't mean to, but you said that you don't have health care and I disagree. You do have health care. You don't have health insurance. Big difference. Big difference. <laughs> That's true. You know, what I really like though about the approach you take, the holistic approach you take to health is that it actually is holistic. It's the consideration for literally everything about your life, both past and present and how it impacts your well-being. You know, I've seen both a naturopath and a functional medicine doctor for the last few years. And for example, for people who haven't seen these types of practitioners, the intake forms as a new client, like 15 and 20 pages each. It's the entire history of your life, like filled out in these forms. And we're talking way beyond the physical. We're talking emotional, psychological, spiritual. But the one thing that I found that my practitioners lacked actually was an account for the actual environment around me, the quality of my air, the quality of my indoor lighting, the quality of my water, my personal EMF exposure, you know, things like that. I know you focus on all those things with your clients. And I'm wondering how early in the process with your clients, do you talk about these environmental inputs and exposures? Because from my own experience, I don't think these conversations happen soon enough, even in the holistic space, if they happen at all. Yeah. I think you're, you're right on there. Most people don't ask those questions. How much sunlight are you getting? How much time do you spend in front of a screen? Right up front, I'll ask people, tell me about your daily lifestyle. What are things you do? And they'll say, oh, I go to work on Zoom from nine to seven at night. And so that right there, that information tells me so much about what we need to do to get them in a better place. So if we ignore that right from the get go, we're going to not set them up for the the biggest healing successes they, they have. We have to know what kind of environment they're living in, working in, sleeping in. That's really important to know right from the get-go. Like, what kind of environment are you in? Is it in front of a screen? Are you a farmer and you're outside doing your thing? I have somebody who's a construction worker who's outside all day. It's going to get a completely different plan than somebody who works on Zoom all day inside. So these are really important things to know because they're going to determine how you age, what diseases you're susceptible to, and probably why you're struggling with whatever you're struggling with when you walk through the door. So man, I, I agree with you because my mom sees, uh, goes to a naturopath and um, my dad goes to a regular doctor. None of them ask them anything about their lifestyle, their environment, how much sun they get, you know, and these can say so much about their health and what they need actually to heal and overcome whatever they walk in the door with. Well, I want to say something to your mom and dad right now that they should be practicing with you. I don't know why they're not. <laughs> my, they do. They do. Okay. My mom goes to a naturopath for blood work. They, they do. My dad's a little bit more stubborn, but my mom's right on board. She's right there. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I take that back then. No, it's good. I like it. But uh, to all the points that we've made so far, I'm going to throw this out there because, you know, we talked about you healing from your TBI and you living this primal lifestyle, going back to those roots. And I wanted to throw a quote out here that you said in one of your podcasts, you said, I, I noticed that as I began to go back to my primal roots, I felt best when I was outside. And so my biggest health breakthrough came when I learned about how light runs and determines the state and health of our mitochondria, of our regeneration programs, and of our circadian biology. And so you incorporated more sunlight into that healing routine, more frequency, more outdoors, less indoors, essentially. And basically what we're just talking about, the actual environment around you is what facilitated healing and optimal health. I can't tell you how many thousands of dollars I spent on trying to heal myself with my acupuncture, chiropractic, what you name it, you name it, every single thing you could think of out there. And one day I heard a podcast about sunlight's impact on 
healing and the brain. And I was like, hmm, interesting. Well, I'm just, you know, at that time I was deep in my online business in front of a screen most of my, my day, which was really not serving my TBI very well at all. So I started to watch the sunrise. I did it for like a week, 10 days. And I was like, holy shit, like um, I'm sleeping better. I'm not anxious. I have more energy. And now I feel like I just want to be outside. Like my body was literally like saying no to the computer and like get outside. And I was like, oh my gosh, like this is insane. The thousands of dollars I spent. And then I do this thing that's basically free, this, you know, light in the sky and start to have some of the biggest healing breakthroughs I'd had in a decade because it's been that long for, since my TBI that I discovered sunlight. And its impact on on mitochondrial health, brain health, healing the brain. And I just started practicing and, and going outside in sunlight. And I was shocked. I'm still shocked today as to how, I don't know why, you know, we shouldn't, we really shouldn't be because this, this is like our primal essence right here is we, we're designed and built to be in sunlight, our physiology, our biology, et cetera. So as soon as I started to do that, starting at sunrise, man, night and day, night and day with regard to my brain health and my healing. And, and that really sent my work and my life in a totally different direction. It was huge. Yeah. And I mentioned the mitochondria in that quote that I read, and you've mentioned it a couple of times too. And you actually wrote in a, a short ebook on your website that the functioning of your mitochondria is the single most determining factor of your health and aging process. So with that in mind, I think it's important to then explain to those in the audience who don't know what exactly the mitochondria are and what role it does play in the body and our health. Yeah, really simple. If you have a science background or not, doesn't matter. You know, basically you have hundreds to thousands of these tiny, tiny mitochondria. It's actually a type of bacteria located in each one of your cells. And their main job is to allow you to pump out energy, oxygen, and water at the cellular level. And your ability to do this determines your health and how you age and what diseases you're susceptible to. And if you can recover from chronic disease that you may be struggling with right now. So the brain has the biggest square footage of mitochondria in the body, I guess, packed into that tiny little space, the heart as well. And so as I began to learn this, I was like, whoa, well, the mitochondria in my brain are really damaged from the TBI and need serious healing. And sunlight played a major role because sunlight helps to restore the function of the mitochondria, improve energy production, oxygen, water production at the cellular level. And so this was a huge breakthrough for me and my healing. But for those of you out there, all of your cells, you know, the trillions of cells you have, have hundreds to thousands of mitochondria inside each one of those. And how well your mitochondria work really determine how you're going to age, what diseases you're susceptible to, and if you're able to actually heal and recover from those diseases. You mentioned water. And I want to point out, because we just talked about this with another guest, we touched on structured water. That's the type of water that your mitochondria is pumping out. It's that fourth phase, that more gelatinous type of water. And so we know how important that is to our health. So light and water go hand in hand here. It's crazy like how simple this really is. Like these things that we take for granted, the sun, the type of water we drink, you know, like how healing and regenerative these sources are. And I want to say something else that you mentioned about the mitochondria in one of your podcast episodes. This is getting a little dense here, but I like the density here. But you said that one of its main goals is to tunnel electrons across the inner mitochondrial membrane and that these electrons only interact with photons. And where do we get photons from? Sunlight. I guess the point is that the more photons you receive from sunlight, the healthier your mitochondria will be. That's right. It excites the electrons and these electrons from light and from the food that you eat, both, both of these, these sources, but you can only, you can only achieve about 33% of your energy requirements, your body's energy requirement needs from food. The other part comes from sunlight. And we have this backwards in our healing world today, which is why people can only typically get so far by using diet to help uh, address a, a health issue before they, they hit a wall and they bump up against a wall and, and then they try a new diet, et cetera. But light tunnels uh, electrons. It helps to tunnel electrons efficiently across the inner mitochondrial membrane. And on each one of your mitochondria, you have five proteins and the electrons tunnel across 
these proteins and they get to the end goal, which is cytochrome 5, which is where you pump out energy, ATP energy. And so light, sunlight in particular, junk light has a detrimental effect on this, but sunlight and sunlight exposure actually improves your body's ability to do this. And so I used to run a a Facebook group called the Keto Cancer Solution. And I just switched the name to Natural Approaches to Mitochondrial Diseases because people would sign up for that Facebook group and they want to know about a ketogenic diet. And I got to this point where I was like, we need to change the name and the direction of this group because people are placing literally so much emphasis on diet. They're getting very dogmatic about it. And they're leaving out this huge piece of the healing pie, which is sunlight and light. And especially people who have cancer, man, they need so much sunlight to heal and to get their mitochondria basically are broken. They need to be repaired and We can go into that when we talk about sunlight and melatonin's role in that. But I changed the name of that group because people get so attached onto a diet and these dogmatic diets and they lose track of these other parts of health that are so important when it comes to to the healing process. So yeah, I think it's I think it's huge. Mitochondria are if your mitochondria are in good shape, man, you're gonna be in uh awesome shape. You're gonna be a centenarian in, unless you get hit by a car, you know? <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. And to your point about cancer, I think it's important to know too, just I love these little breakdowns that you've done. And you said that cancer is actually when these electrons are tunneling too fast across that membrane. Is that right? Yeah, that's accurate. And I think some of the science now is showing they can either be too fast or too slow, actually. So it can kind of go in either direction. So some of them, they can just go, they can fly across there. It doesn't slow things down because your body needs a certain pace, so to speak, in order to heal and repair because melatonin is a huge part of that healing and repairing process. So if you think of like a train just flying by, it doesn't even have time to stop at your station. You can't get on the train. It's like you're going to miss the train. And that's exactly what happens in cancer or it goes so slow that it can't actually get across the membrane in order to produce energy, oxygen and water. So I think you can have both extremes for sure. Yeah. So in addition to light, then what is it that helps us charge this mitochondrial battery that we have inside of us? What makes it run at these better voltages besides sunlight? That's a really good question. So I'd say sunlight, definitely number one. And I honestly think that we can tie in here what drains the battery because that is that will kind of answer the question as well. So anything man-made, EMF-related, Wi-Fi, cell phones, et cetera, I can't tell you how many people carry. I see running, like women running with their cell phone in their bra, totally destroying the mitochondria and the breast tissue, and they're going to set themselves up for breast cancer. Unfortunately, I see this a lot. So those type of things definitely deplete the battery. So Being in sunlight, placing your feet in the ground, especially grounding, that's going to help recharge your battery. Getting in the ocean, if you're not by the ocean, getting in some natural body of water, a lake, a stream, a river, that is all going to help. Cold therapy can can definitely help. Homeopathy, which I know we're going to talk about later, can definitely help. And making sure that you mitigate your light environment, your artificial light environment, especially after the sun sets, you're going to be protecting your mitochondria as well. And I will mention that some people come in with more compromised mitochondria than others. And so some people literally might need to take, you know, they might need to take more extreme measures than others when it comes to helping to support their mitochondrial health. Do things like breath work and movement also help improve that? Absolutely. A hundred percent. I'm a big fan of both of those things and movement for sure. That's one of the suggestions I also make to people who just have gotten off a plane or have done a long car ride or, or road trip. If you can get out and move your body, whether it's a walk or exercise, that's going to help support your mitochondria and help them recover because those things can totally trash the mitochondria, especially if you're doing like a transcontinental flight or overseas or something man, that'll just trash the mitochondria. So getting out and doing some kind of movement, just in general, but really, if you do some kind of long travel like that can be super helpful to the mitochondria. But you want to make sure when you exercise, it's not in a gym and under fake light. 
that's going to create a whole different scenario at the mitochondrial level than if you to, were to go for a walk outside or exercise outside. You're going to create totally different free radicals at the mitochondrial level. And uh, that actually will determine a lot about your health because there's, there's basically two types of free radicals you could produce at the mitochondrial level, meaning energy you can produce singlet state or triplet state free radicals. If you're producing triplet state, these are the kind of free radicals that's like clean burning energy. These are the type of free radicals you produce when you're outside, when you're in sunlight, when you're working out in sunlight versus the singlet state. When you're working outside in in a gym, it's going to be like those cars who don't pass the emissions test, who just their fuel smells like crap. That's the type of fuel you're going to be producing when you're working out in a basically a junk light environment. So you want to make sure that you're exercising in the right environment. That's going to be really, really important when it comes to supporting your mitochondrial health for sure. Yeah. I think that free radical point is important too, for people who are into holistic health to this level, because I've, I've heard that discussed over the years. And I think all free radicals tend to get lumped in as these things that you have to sort of get rid of. And it's, that's not true. Like you do have some positive ones that flow through and and help cleanse and help heal the body too. So just a couple other points here, you know, we're talking about mitochondria, the cells specifically, we know that they all sort of vibrate at specific frequencies and that this vibration is actually determined by what the cell has been exposed to. So some of these more negative inputs, you know, like EMF, uh, artificial light, bad diet too, it's going to lower that vibration. And then some of these more positive ones that we've talked about are going to help raise that vibration. And that's, I think one reason why people can't heal as well, or can't regenerate is that these programs are just so depleted because of these, these negative inputs, right? And they can't make new cells, I guess is what I'm trying to say too. That's a great point. And that's, that's exactly why these things are so important to take into consideration when you're, you're looking to heal, you reach out to a health practitioner, you really need to consider the environment for these exact reasons you're talking about. So, so important. Yeah, those um, regeneration programs that people may have heard of, autophagy, apoptosis, these things run on what I was trying to get to. They run on light and frequency. So yes, that's a great point. I think that a lot of people, this is a great time to bring in melatonin because the more melatonin you're able to make and recycle in UVA sunlight, the more melatonin is going to be released from your pineal gland at night when dark sets in melatonin spearheads autophagy and apoptosis. So autophagy is like your cells that are broken. Maybe they're broken because you party like a rock star at night and um, you're looking at fake light or maybe doing a line of cocaine or whatever you're doing, smoking a lot of weed. And so you have all these broken proteins and cells in your body that never get repaired until you replenish your melatonin stores in AM sunlight allow your body to sleep at night, and then melatonin goes in and can repair those broken cells. Now, some cells are to the point where there's no repair, and that's when apoptosis becomes very important because uh, and melatonin is also spearheads this process where it goes into the cell, and the cell that is beyond repair, it allows the cell to die and basically cleans house. And so if we can't achieve those two things, then we're just going to continuously live off of either broken cells or cells that are beyond damage. And so this is kind of the start of disease when we feel like, oh, I have insomnia or I can't sleep or you wake up and you just can't wake up. Like you're so tired, you have chronic fatigue. And this is the start of chronic diseases when our regeneration programs fail because we don't replenish our melatonin stores in AM sunlight. People don't really understand melatonin today either and and neither does the allopathic community, which is unfortunate. So you replenish your melatonin stores in UVA sunlight and your body stores, basically creates a surplus of melatonin and stores it in your pineal gland. And then after sunset, if you are basically abiding by nature's rules and not looking at your screen all night or turning on artificial light, that melatonin is released from your pineal gland two to four hours after night. Now, you can delay that process the more you look at a screen or flip on your LED lights. So if it's sunset and you have all the lights on in your house and it looks like noon in there, you're going to delay the release of melatonin, which is going to delay the amount of healing and regeneration you're able to achieve at night. So just by getting your melatonin cycle down, by recycling it in, in AM sunlight, 
and learning how to mitigate artificial light at night. If you do this one thing, you likely have serious breakthroughs with your health just by doing that one thing. It, it's literally a huge, huge aspect to health. I'm so glad you brought it up. It's a good question. It's a really good point. And it's at the heart of why we have so many chronic diseases today, but not even chronic diseases. Most people just don't even feel good. They don't feel good. They wake up and they feel like shit every day. And one main reason is because we don't recycle our melatonin stores. And then we look at artificial light way too long after sunset, or we don't mitigate it. And then we delay that release of melatonin into the bloodstream. It's huge when it comes to our health. Yeah. And that is when this degeneration process happens, right? This is when this oxygen tension level just gets lowered as well. And that's like you said, when disease forms in this cell and then slowly dies off. So you also described my college days when you were talking about late night parties and uh, maybe some substance use here and there. So I can tell you for (laughs) sure, my circadian cycle completely fucked up when I was in my college days. It took me a while to understand exactly what that was, which is such an easy concept to comprehend when you really get down to it. And we'll talk more about that as we get more into the Sunlight RX here. But when to circle back to like, you know, you kind of hinted at dieting doesn't work by itself. Supplements don't work by themselves. Even combined, those two things are not going to solve all of your problems. And I think it's because of where we're at at this point in history, because of this extremely toxic environment that we live in right now. We need better solutions. And you say that light is the number one factor here, which we've kind of alluded to. And uh, to this point, you created a program for your clients called the Sunlight RX based around this idea. And before we dive deeper into sunlight and all the cool things about that, or maybe the warm things about it, uh, let's talk about the type of light that got us into this mess in the first place, artificial light. Tell us a bit about what you've seen in your practice and your research about artificial light. I guess we're talking about LED, fluorescent, non-native blue light, maybe even incandescent. Tell us what you've seen about the impact of artificial light on our mitochondrial health and then our general health as well. Yeah, that's uh, that's a really good question. I think this is an important thing for everyone to understand. And it definitely relates to the melatonin conversation we were just having. But if we, we start with the incandescent bulb, which was the first artificial light source that entered the home, the incandescent bulb actually wasn't so detrimental to our health until we started using it after sunset. That's when the issue started because the incandescent bulb, unlike the light bulbs we use today, they have a warmer color temperature, meaning they don't, it's not a cooler temperature. The warmer temperatures are the reds, the violets, et cetera. The cooler temperatures are when we just single out the blues and a little bit of green in there as well. So the incandescent bulb actually is one of the healthier bulbs if we use it during daytime hours because it resembles sunlight the most, meaning it contains a spectrum of different colors. The issue with that is that we could make daytime at night with that invention. And so then night shift came in and we were staying up all hours of the night doing whatever we were doing, right? So then we get into this, you know, the fluorescent lights came through and fluorescent lights are really interesting because they actually give off mercury vapor. So <laughs> they they not only have this detrimental effect of creating all, the completely blue green light. OK, so this is like they took out the reds and the violets because they weren't as energy efficient right? So the reds and the violets, they're going to use up more energy. Your electric bill is going to be higher, basically, which is where the LED came in when we completely, you know, they said they're energy efficient. The Obama administration passed like the LED bulb, you know, it was this huge thing that we're working for energy efficiency. I think Trump actually, he either worked to reverse that. I don't know if he completely did, but he was working to bring the incandescent bulb. I think he did. Yeah, I think he did. Cool. So the fluorescence you have, it's just, then we have all this blue light, but also we have not only blue light, but these mercury vapors coming off of the light. So not only are you getting toxic blue light, which when we just single out blue light in a bulb, it destroys the endocrine system. The incandescent doesn't have as much of a drastic impact on the endocrine system because it has a wider range of colors in the bulb. When we just single out blue, it's a train wreck for the endocrine system. So we have that in the fluorescence and then the fluorescence give off the mercury vapor as well. So not only are you getting that, the blue light, you're frigging breathing in mercury from the light bulbs that are coming off of the light. So that's a total shit show for people. And then we get to the LEDs and they're much brighter. 
they're quote unquote energy efficient for your electricity bill, but for your own energy production needs at the mitochondrial level, it's a complete disaster. It just is. And we don't make this connection to the impact that light has on our health and it has a huge impact on our health. So when we're looking at this artificial light or junk light that has progressively gotten worse over time, we see a lot of changes in our health. So we see a lot more endocrine disorders that have come into play since the fluorescence and the LEDs. It's a, it's really a train wreck for the endocrine system because of its impact on cortisol and melatonin. And the more you go up on that spectrum, so incandescent, we can take candle, incandescent, fluorescent, LED, the more you go up, the more you deplete your melatonin levels. You know, I think an LED, just by flipping it on, you, you can deplete your your melatonin levels by something like 80%. So there goes your healing for the day just by flipping that on after sunset. Wow. You know, one of the things that I like to explain to people in my day-to-day life, uh, you know, friends and family is how do you know these things are harmful? I think one way to talk about it is remember old TV shows and movies when they would show a computer screen, it would have that flicker on it. And I tried to explain that, like, it's not just screens that do that. It's light bulbs too. Light bulbs have this really hypnotic flicker effect that it really does feel like it's a hypnosis. Like you get sort of like lulled into this. I don't even know if you call it a trance, but it does do something. It is fucking with your biology on that level. That's true. And there's flicker built into certain apps and certain screens and to the point where we can't see it like we could back then, right? You know, now it's like so minimal that we can't see it, but the, actually the, um, the cornea of the eye will, will continue to pulsate trying to adjust to that flicker. And that does some serious things to your circadian biology, your time clock, uh, your endocrine function. Flicker is a huge issue as well, for sure. Yeah. And you just mentioned time clock. That was my next point. If you could tell us a little bit about this time clock system, the melanopsin system that's located literally on every square inch of our body on our skin, right? Yeah. It's a fascinating system. It's basically your body has to know how to tell time. Depending on what time it is, it will release certain hormones and chemicals and metabolic signals. And those are supposed to vary throughout the day. And it's important that they do do so at the correct times of day for our health. So your body has to have a way to detect what time it is so it knows what to release. When are you hungry? When are you supposed to heal versus when are you supposed to fight or flight and have energy? So there's a main hub time clock located behind your retina called the SCN or the um, supercosmetic nucleus. And that time clock is set depending on the type of light that hits your eye, hits your retina. That is the main hub that literally signals to every other time clock in your body what time it is. You also have time clocks located across every square inch of your skin, and this is the melanopsin system. And so depending on the type of light that hits your skin also sends these messages to your body, to the gene clocks in your body, telling them what time it is. So we were designed to have this time clock work smooth sailing when we're in sunlight. We'll get into this more when we get into the nuts and bolts of the Sunlight RX, but sunlight determines, it has very different types of frequencies that it emits depending on the type of day, sunrise, early morning, late morning, afternoon, sunset. All of these frequencies are different and these different frequencies stimulate and trigger the release of different chemicals, hormones, metabolic signals in your body. Now, when you swap sunlight for a screen or an LED light or fluorescent, you just like threw a total chaotic signal to your retina, to your skin. If you're, you know, working on your screen without a shirt on or, you know, short sleeves or whatnot, and you're just, you're creating a state of what's called circadian mismatch, meaning your body's in this mismatch state. It doesn't know what time it is anymore which creates chaos, it creates inflammation. And this is the start of basically every chronic disease right there. Yeah, I love that term circadian mismatch. I'd never heard anybody use that before until I started listening to your podcast. I think it's a great way to describe what it is we're talking about. And to the point of light absorption, you talked about how it's absorbed through the eyes, obviously in the skin. But something else that I was, I've been trying to learn more about recently is how light gets absorbed through the gut. Could you maybe tell us a little bit about that? 
Yeah, it's interesting. It's the same way because, and this is why when we get into the Sunlight RX, we'll, we'll talk more about this, but this is why anybody who comes into my practice with gut health issues, I say, when you're outside, take your shirt off because your gut literally needs to receive these signals from sunlight. So not only does it receive it from when sunlight quite literally hits your gut, but also everybody is pretty familiar with the gut brain access, like this brain gut connection. And what really determines your, your brain gut health in this connection and how it functions is the light that hits your eye because that's where the brain gut connection links. So the sun that hits our eyes also has to do with the type of beneficial bacteria we produce in the gut. And this is just an area of research that we're beginning to see. They're starting to make these connections between people who live in a strong sunlight environment. Even if they do the shitty things that we do today, take antibiotics, eat junk food, eat soda, if they're in a strong light environment, meaning they live kind of close to the equator where sunlight and UVB light is strongest, as long as they're outside in that light, their gut microbiome isn't altered. So we don't get the, you know, simplified guts that we get when we do those things and we live a modern lifestyle. And this is a huge topic in and of itself that anybody who comes into my practice and I tell them, I was like, no, we're not going to do probiotics. We're not going to do prebiotics. We're going to do sunlight. We're going to do certain things with a diet. We're going to do homeopathy, but we're going to do sunlight as the main probiotic because your gut microbiome produces certain bacteria depending on the light that hits your eyes and hits your gut. And this is something that is like, well, I think less than 1% of the population is familiar with at this time. And I just hope it continues to blow up because people are going to see, and I know I've seen with my clients, huge health breakthroughs when they add in the sunlight piece. For sure. So I want to throw a scenario at you because I don't watch a lot of TV, thankfully. I've cut that out of my life for the most part. But there are some moments, especially at night, where I'm like, I just need a break from you know, working on the podcast or working on you know, creative writing or whatever it is I'm doing with my time. And I just need to disconnect for a moment. So I put on a movie. I put on my blue light blockers, the nighttime version of them. And I think, I'm great. I'm protected. Well, actually, I'm not. Because if I'm sitting there in the dark watching this blue screen just, you know, bombard me with light frequencies, and I only have my blue light blockers on, I'm protecting my eyes. But to your point earlier, I'm not actually protecting my skin. And I'm still contributing to my own circadian mismatch, right? You definitely are. It's kind of like, because the of the the clocks that are located on your skin, put a long sleeve shirt on, a blanket, you know, bundle up or something. And then a really easy hack that people can do is download Iris, which is, I think you can do it for 14 bucks and some of them you can do it for free is download Iris is a blue blocking software on your computer. Put that thing in health mode and then put your, your red blue blockers on after sunset and you're going to be protecting yourself much better because health mode basically blocks all the blue light. And if you have your, you know, any that's left over, if you have the red glasses on, yeah, sure. The game you're watching or the movie you're watching is going to look red, but you're not going to be destroying your health. So the payoff's pretty good, you know? (laughs) And so if you're protecting your skin, it's really important because people do this with, with sunlight too. They'll put on sunglasses and they'll go outside and like tan or lay on the beach with their shirt off or in their bikini or whatnot. And if your eyes are blocking the sun and your skin is receiving strong sunlight, basically you're telling your eye clock that it's nighttime, but your skin that it's like noon or 1 p.m. And this also creates a mismatch as well. So it's really important that both the skin and the eyes are protected and they're both in sunlight because your body functions based on how these two clocks are communicating with each other. Yeah, the Iris is a good uh, software for the computer. I do have it on on my machines and I I did the whole like red light hack on my iPhone. So I got that covered, but I still don't have a solution for the actual television set if I want to use that, which I don't use it as much, but there's no really way around that. And that's a much bigger screen, you know, for a lot of people that are getting that blue light spectrum from. So aside from the the blockers and I guess just like putting on more clothes or blankets to protect your skin, I don't know a way around that. Yeah, that's a tough one. I guess what I would also do is maybe... You know, if your your television's in front of you, maybe put a couple of like red light lamps like by it just to try to offset it a bit. 
I would try that, but that's a, that is a tougher one when you just are using the television like that because you can't put Iris on a TV, at least not yet, but you could try to offset it a little bit by setting some red lights up there and see how that goes for you. That, that'll at least give you some more protection for sure. Yeah. Well, I hope you can see, I do have some red light lamps in this room. So, <laughs> so we've mentioned the Sunlight RX and this is a, a program that you've developed for your clients and we should definitely get into the nuts and bolts of that, as you said. So just give us a, a brief overview and then we'll dig more into it. The Sunlight RX is basically a four-step protocol that walks you through how to use sunlight to support your mitochondrial health, boost your vitamin D levels, your melatonin levels. It's a protocol that I developed just by healing myself in sunlight. And from my experience of that, I started to make such drastic and dramatic health improvements. I started to incorporate it with my family, then my clients. Everybody was improving. I was like, okay, I got to get this thing out on paper. So I did. And so basically it's a four-step protocol to help you heal or support your mitochondria, your overall health, and improve your vitamin D and melatonin levels just by using sunlight. Yeah. And if you could maybe tell us a little bit about what those four steps actually are and then how you personalize them for your clients. So there's basically four steps. And the thing that I think modern people misunderstand about sunlight is they think they can just go out at any time and get the benefits, which you're going to go out and you're going to get benefits, right? But there's certain steps we have to take in a certain chronological order. Because as I mentioned here in the show is that sunlight has different spectrums of light that it emits depending on the time of day. And those spectrums are going to determine what kind of chemicals, hormones, metabolic signals you release. And so if we just start by going out at 12 noon, we're going to miss the whole first half of the day of the sunlight spectrum, the solar spectrum, and how it sets our body up to be able to be prepared for solar noon. So really the Sunlight RX, it's important to know first and foremost that it's in order for it to work, in order for you to reap all the benefits from sunlight, you have to go out in chronological order. And that starts with sunrise. There's blue light present and there's red light present. And this presses pause on your melatonin release that hopefully was released during nighttime that allowed you to heal, regenerate, rest, digest. And it presses pause on melatonin and does this switch over to cortisol release. Most people don't start releasing their cortisol until 9, 10, some people noon. And we need to start that process right at sunrise. So red light helps to, boom, here comes cortisol. Cortisol allows you to be productive. It allows you to have energy. It's like basically your cup of coffee from sunlight. And the more cortisol that builds into your system, because the higher that sun gets in the sky as the day goes on, the more cortisol you release as it goes to its apex. So red light and during sunrise, as well as blue light, preconditions your skin. Meaning when you get to step three, which is UVB light, the light, the only light we can make vitamin D from, your body's going to be able to absorb that vitamin D, that UVB light, turn it into vitamin D without getting a sunburn. And this is really important, especially for people who have lighter skin. Because I have people come to me all the time, hey, Heather, I always burn in sunlight. I can't do the sunlight RX. I have red hair freckles. I'm light skinned. I'm Irish descent, whatever. As like, I totally get that. And it's total horseshit. What they've told you, the dermatology world, the the medical world, the sunscreen, it's all a bunch of horseshit because we know that the higher one's vitamin D levels are, the lower their risk of dying from any disease, chronic or infectious. So it makes no sense to try to block vitamin D with sunscreen or to limit our exposure. So we have to prep our body though, to be able to get there. And We do that in AM sunlight with sunrise, with the blue and red that's present then, and then UVA comes into the solar spectrum after that, which allows us to put another coat on our skin. So when that UVB light shows up, we're able to absorb it without burning. And then we get the sunset and the sun goes back down the horizon. And this then allows us to start pressing pause on cortisol and be able to make that switch into melatonin release. That's the Sunlight RX in a nutshell. And so if we're able to go out in sunlight in this order throughout the day, 
if you like just do that, if you just add that to your healthcare practice right now, you're going to see serious improvements in your overall health. So before we go, then tell people, Heather, where they can find you and your work. Yeah, sure. Um, so you can visit me at heathershepherd.com. Uh, my name's spelled a little weird. It's H-E-A-T-H-A-R. So you can go to my site there. I also, this January, am launching a holistic health certification course for people looking to learn this information regarding the science and also just the ancient ways of healing in the holistic health certification course. So you can go to holistichealthcoachcertification.com to learn more about that. I'm launching that and it's starting this January. Ryan mentioned the Primal Pioneer. I try to put up weekly podcast episodes there. And um, you can follow me on Instagram at sunlight underscore Rx. Yep. All that will be linked in the show notes for sure. So Heather, seriously, thank you so much. I thought this was great. And part one of two here, that we can uh, tease the audience for next time. We'll get more into homeopathy, radionics, and some more of the cool shit, really. So I look forward to that. Yeah, me too, Ryan. Thanks for having me on the show. It's it's been awesome to, to be here with you. I hope your audience enjoys it. And there you have it. My thanks again to Heather Shepard. Please do check out her work by clicking the links in the show notes. And please do get outside as much as possible. I know it's about to be winter here in the Northern Hemisphere and there's not as much sunlight and virtually no vitamin D in some places, but what a great way to combine some cold exposure with whatever sunlight you can find and what a great way to get into the habit of doing it so that when springtime comes back around, you're ready to rock and roll. And speaking of rocking and rolling, in the second hour, Heather and I talked about specific features and benefits of sunrise, sunset, and UVA and UVB sunlight including specific hormone production and metabolic benefits associated with the UV spectrum. Heather mentioned the D-Minder app, D-M-I-N-D-E-R, that'll help you track the daily UV index in your area. We also got into the difference between sunlight and red light therapy, including the drawbacks to red light therapy devices, but also the benefits of red light bulbs in place of artificial light bulbs. We talked about the body using the skin and the face in particular as a dumping ground for toxicity and the cancer confusion this causes in allopathic medicine. We also talked about vitamin D. It's a hormone, not a vitamin, and talked about its connection to LDL cholesterol. Got into the difference between vitamin D from sunlight and supplements and the dangers of vitamin D supplementation. The role of hydration in vitamin D production the best food sources of vitamin D and how to maintain higher levels in the winter. And I wrap the chat by asking Heather for some brief thoughts on germ versus terrain theory. So you can hear the full episode and all others by subscribing to the show on Substack for seven bucks a month. If you're not keen on subscribing, you can also support the show with a one-time donation at detox.com slash donate. Both those links are in the show notes. Of course, you can also help us create more sunlight by donating at busttheagenda.com. I mentioned that in the last episode with Mitch, the orgone donor. All money raised there goes directly toward the acquisition of materials to create orgone energy devices to help combat geoengineering. And again, get more sunlight into our environment. That's busttheagenda.com. Or, or, hot off the presses, so to speak, you can contribute to a massive fundraising campaign that I've just launched for a business idea that is not only necessary in our current climate, but also quite unique. There's a GoFundMe link in the show notes for something I'm calling Soul Source, a holistic wellness sanctuary, and that's S-O-L, Soul. Now, I was trying to figure out how to best talk about this on the podcast here, and I realized that I wrote everything I wanted to say in the description for the fundraiser itself. So if you'll indulge me for a few minutes, I'm just going to read what I wrote because it's the best way to summarize what I'm trying to do here. So bear with me for a bit. This is the introduction to the fundraiser. My name is Ryan, obviously. I'm attempting to break out of the dreaded 9-to-5 life and start something that I believe will benefit humanity as we collectively heal from the psychological, emotional, and spiritual damage done to us in recent years. I appeal to those of you with strong and steadfast morals, unwavering faith, and a never-ending supply of love and support for your fellow man, regardless of race, religion, politics, or other arbitrary divisions. My journey to this point of my life is complicated and convoluted. Suffice to say, I have overcome both trauma and addiction. But along the path I've traveled, I've discovered just how much my psychological, emotional, and spiritual well-being manifests in the health of my physical body. If this sounds far-fetched, absurd, or a bit hyperbolic, I assure you it's not. And there's plenty of resources available out there in the ether should you be curious about such things. 
Regardless, this fundraiser is not meant to educate or empower anyone in those areas, at least not in this iteration. Instead, what I want to present to you is a more viable, more practical path forward in certain business sectors, sectors that seem to be suddenly segregating services to certain portions of the population. Thankfully, there's a better way to do business as we heal and move forward together. Many years ago, I wandered into a business that required me to pay $25 for a membership before I could enter. I thought, man, that's pretty high for a cover charge. And after I agreed to the fee, I was presented with the membership agreement that required my signature. And I thought, this is a rather peculiar way to do business, not a cover charge, actually. But I signed the form, received a copy of my membership agreement, and entered the establishment. And my momentary curiosity quickly faded into the night. Years later, I realized the type of business I had entered into that night was not an Inc., nor was it an LLC. It was a private membership association, or a PMA. I only recently became aware of this term after hearing it discussed in passing on a podcast I listen to regularly. The mention of it reignited my curiosity, and I set off to learn more about it. In a nutshell, a PMA is exactly as it sounds. Businesses registered as an Inc. or an LLC are considered public entities engaging in commerce in the public sector. They're governed by the state and its regulatory agencies and their plethora of laws, rules, and regulations. A PMA, however, participates in commerce as a private entity in the private sector. Because of this distinction, they're not beholden to the state and its regulatory agencies and that plethora of laws, rules, and regulations. Instead, they conduct their business in private with the association's paying members under one condition. The private membership association cannot put their members in any clear or present danger. If you've ever heard of drinking clubs in dry counties, many of which are still located across the country, this is how they're able to operate. Despite local laws prohibiting the sale and distribution of alcohol, the private drinking club can operate independently of such laws. PMAs can cross state lines, operate in one location or many, and operate online. Ideally, this PMA would be able to serve people in my local area, Southwest Ohio, as well as online, but this idea can go anywhere. More on that near the end. Now, I call this a holistic wellness sanctuary, and my faith in the creator, in source, and in nature is unwavering. As a human, I know I'm not above or separate from the earth and the natural environment, but am instead a vital and integrated part of it, which means I'm a vital and integrated part of creation itself. Now, this knowledge informs my faith in the abundance of nature and the prosperity it provides every living being on earth. I make this distinction because the business at heart is faith-based. I use the term sanctuary literally. It's a place of refuge where the like-minded and like-hearted can congregate to love and care for themselves and others while celebrating our connection to source and all provided here for us. At the same time, I acknowledge the body I inhabit as a miraculous creation, fully capable of healing itself if given the proper tools, inputs, and attention. I refer to the human body among my social circle as the smartest machine on earth, Every artificial piece of technology ever created has in some way mimicked what our bodies, with help from our minds and our spirit, can inherently accomplish. Computers store memory and are now capable of intelligence. Cameras can adjust aperture to focus on images near and far. The oil and gas that flows through an engine is no different than the blood and water that flows through your veins. With this in mind and in heart, I take a holistic approach to wellness, combining mind, body, and spirit, and want to provide a place where people can come together to celebrate their own miraculous creation. Heal yourself, heal the world, as many have said before me. Now, the business model, my idea, revolves around three central tenets, the first of which is holistic wellness coaching. Truthfully, prior to 2020, I was well on my way to becoming a certified holistic health coach with a primary focus on nutrition and a specialty in nutrition for children and pregnant women. However, when the world shut down, I stepped back to reevaluate my life plans. Was this the right time to make a wholesale career change and venture into the health coaching business? Frankly, I wasn't sure if it was, based on the reactions I was seeing across the world. But the last two years have actually furthered my excitement and enthusiasm for this endeavor. And again, speaking truthfully, I'm pretty dangerous on my own without any licenses or certifications. The phrase self-taught comes to mind, but these licenses and certifications bring with them a tremendous amount of credibility that I wouldn't have otherwise. Part of wellness coaching is knowing a thing or two about the nutritional inputs from food that impact your health. Food, however, is just a small part of what impacts your overall health. Other energetic inputs like water, air, light, sound magnetism, all of which carry their own frequency, they can also make or break your health. And I'd be studying and integrating these inputs as well. The second tenant of my idea in the business model, restaurant and event space. Perhaps the most underrated dietary input is community. 
If you've ever heard of the Blue Zones, where residents live extended lifespans compared to the rest of the world, the one thing these seemingly disparate areas have in common is a robust communal atmosphere. Their social-centric, family and friend-oriented lifestyles contribute to their overall wellness and longevity. How else would people from different parts of the world with vastly different food inputs have equally impressive lifespans? So what are some of the best communal experiences then? Eating together, moving together, dancing together, singing together, being grateful together. A physical space is paramount to this. I want to provide a space where locally sourced organic non-GMO foods are available in our kitchen, where members can meditate, do yoga, and exercise, where members can gather to take in a film or live music or a live podcast, and where members can congregate in fellowship with each other. And finally, the third tenet of the business model, community-supported agriculture, better known as the CSA. If you survived the great toilet paper scare of 2020, you know that a more localized supply chain is necessary and no supply chain is more critical than our food supply. I've been personally buying meat and produce from local farmers and growers for nearly a decade and kick myself often for not having embraced that way of life sooner. I want to continue to support those local farmers and growers by featuring their foods and products in the brick and mortar space. Not only that, but in the long term, I'd like to establish a garden and pasture as part of the PMA so that members can have better access to locally sourced, nutritionally dense foods and learn how to live off the land as well. Now, to me, this all sounds great, but what would your money and your donation actually be going toward? The first part, the legal creation of the business. It's $10,000. Second part, the completion of my personal holistic wellness coach certification. That's another $10,000. The third part, health and wellness devices and kitchen and dining equipment, estimated around $50,000. And lastly, of course, money that needs to go towards a brick and mortar space, another $50,000. Now those first two bits, the legal creation of the business and the health coach certification, those are set prices. That's what I need to invest in those. The latter two, the devices, the equipment, the brick and mortar, those are estimates based on my own research and are admittedly longer term goals. Of course, the more money I can raise, the more services and space I can offer, and any funds left over from one area would be applied to another. So in closing, first of all, if you got this far, thank you so much. It took a while to put this together, and I couldn't be more thrilled that you listened to me read through all this. You know, what sticks with me the most and why I'd contribute to this idea if it was presented to me is that any contribution made here is a vote for the future we want to live in. In a world driven by commerce, our commercial transactions mean something. We've all spent frivolously at times, I'm sure, and we don't realize that these transactions actually matter. They show what we value most, and I think it's time we start investing in our local communities, in quality foods, products, and services, and in ourselves. As far as I know, this is a unique, maybe even first-of-its-kind business, so you're also contributing to that. What's more, you're also contributing to an idea, an idea that we have the God-given right to love and care for ourselves and for each other to provide ourselves and our communities with places of refuge and sanctuary where we can learn and grow together, and to an idea that facilitates holistic lifestyles and healing, physically, psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually. And best of all, ideas like these will assuredly spread, because ideas like these are, well, they're contagious. Now, I'll update this fundraiser in the near future with a video of myself so you can put a face to the mission. Until then, thank you for any support you can give. I'm in no hurry to complete this, but the sooner I can get started on it, the better. And that's the end of the fundraiser description. As you can tell, it's a rather large endeavor. The fundraising goal is honestly a rather modest $120,000. It's kind of low for what I want to do here, but it will get me started. And even if I only raise a fraction of that, every penny, whether it's $5 or $500,000, is going toward this idea. So if you're feeling generous this time of year, forget the Substack, forget Bust the Agenda, help me help people and donate to this cause. And honestly, between restarting the podcast here and these other things I'm trying to do, I put a lot of irons in the alchemical fire, so to speak, and I'd love your help and support so we can go on this journey together, a journey of optimal health and wellness and healing our body, our mind, our spirit, and our planet. Or plane. Whatever. More on that in a few weeks as well. But anyway, I'm all talked out, so the sun has set on yet another episode, which means I gotta get to work on this other stuff. So until then, you know what to do. Love yourself. Think for yourself and reclaim authority. Mm -hmm.